Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. We're going to go through some information security news this week. We are recording on Friday, March 18th, but we won't be releasing this episode until March 27th. So you probably will be hearing our help desk security episode and then this episode, but the news will still be pertinent. It's not like anything that is imminent or a rush to fix or anything like that. So it's just interesting news if you haven't read it or missed it lately. So one of the things that happened was President Biden signed a spending bill. And a part of that spending bill included the Cyber Incident Reporting Act. This, I think, is a game changer for our industry. It is one of the first times that the federal government has required sectors to report back if they have a cybersecurity incident. So the bill states that all critical infrastructure companies in the 16 industry sectors identified by the federal government have to report to CISA within 72 hours if they are experiencing a cyber attack or within 24 hours of making a ransomware payment. And this includes companies that are doing business with the DOD or the federal government. The new law gives CISA the authority to even subpoena the companies that fail to report cybersecurity incidents or ransomware payments. And organizations that fail to comply with the subpoena can be referred to the Department of Justice. So really good act in my opinion, and it's a game changer for our industry in general. The provision also requires CISA to launch a program that will warn organizations of vulnerabilities if ransomware is being exploited. And the director of CISA, Jen Easterly, is going to establish a joint ransomware task force to coordinate the federal efforts. They're also going to have a central repository for all of this threat intelligence that the CIA and the FBI and industry partners can pull from. So... In general, I do think that this is, again, a, a great step in the right direction. It will really force companies to take a hard look at their cybersecurity posture, especially in leadership. I think CISOs in the past have been on the outside of that C-suite good old boys club. Sometimes CISOs report to a CIO or they report to a CFO but very rarely do they have a direct line to the CEO and even have veto power over other C-suite members because they've always been seen as a cost to the company and not really a business enabler. And I think this will really force companies to hire a CISO if they don't have one and provide them oversight on a budget and be able to have a say at the table when things might affect the security of a company. We've talked about in the past in a speculative manner, should there be a requirement for companies to disclose? Should there be a requirement not to pay ransomware? like make ransomware payments essentially illegal. While this is the former coming to fruition, where there's now an enforcement mechanism where we can require companies to report. I think overall that's a good thing. I personally know of several companies that have sustained a a relatively severe cybersecurity incident and did not publicly disclose it. And I understand why, because under the current system the way it's structured they don't have to and so i think moving to a point where they have to is the right thing to do i i would compare it in a way to use an analogy to companies today pay oftentimes very very little taxes and 
that is their responsibility to their shareholders to do that. It is your responsibility as a company. You shouldn't pay more taxes than you have to. And if you're mad about the fact that companies pay very little taxes, the way you solve that is by changing the rules of the game. So they have to pay taxes. And this is kind of like that. I don't blame companies for not publicly disclosing if they didn't have to. Why would they? There's reputational damage that comes with that. There's the potential loss of business, loss of contracts that comes with that. I understand companies not wanting to do this, but I applaud bringing them into the light and forcing them to do this. I think this is really positive. I also think you you kind of ran through this pretty quick, Andy, but having CISA have this requirement, this obligation to report and warn of vulnerabilities that ransomware threat actors use, I think that's really positive too. I think the more we can centralize and and normalize the threat intelligence that our government agencies capture today and present that in a single um, database or whatever is really powerful. If you think back to before 9-11, how several different government agencies that were responsible for the security and protection of the United States were all in different siloed portions of the federal government. Some of them were in the Department of State. Some of them were in the Department of Commerce. Like They were all over the place. And centralizing them under the Department of Homeland Security, although it's not been a completely smooth process, and certainly I I think there's suggestions for ways that could still be improved and made better, made a lot of sense in in taking these disparate agencies and helping coordinate all the intelligence they gather in the interest of protecting the country. This kind of feels like that all over again, where as opposed to one big attack that really changed the game here, it's been death by a thousand cuts to realize we need kind of that same effort again for cybersecurity, for protecting the homeland from a, a cyber attack perspective. So this feels really positive. And I see some some similarities here into what happened 20 years ago with Department of Homeland Security to what's happening here with kind of bringing all of that together. So I, I like what I'm seeing in all of these announcements, I think this is really, really positive. And so this act has already been signed and it is going forward, but there are other proposed rules. Like for example, the U S security and exchange commission, the sec proposed rules that would require public companies. So publicly traded companies to report any cybersecurity incidents within four days and make periodic disclosure regarding their cybersecurity risk management strategy and governance. This is also something new because there's no guidance or regulation right now to require companies to report on when, where, or how cybersecurity disclosure happens. Under the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, public companies with more than $10 million in assets whose securities are being held by 2,000 or more record holders or 500 more record holders that are not investors, they must file periodic public reports. And as part of those reports, they must file a Form 8-K to inform investors and the public of major company events. So there are companies today that are filing these 8-Ks to inform their shareholders of cybersecurity incidents, but again, it's not required. So there's no guidance on it, but this proposed rule by the SEC now is most likely going to take effect as well, is going to require companies that are publicly traded to file these reports when there is a cybersecurity incident and provide uh, disclosure on their posture. So I think, again, that is a good thing. That'll affect any publicly traded company. And it's just bringing more and more requirements to companies to make sure that they have not only a good cybersecurity posture, but also mandatory reporting. This is all around positive news. And this is not just positive news for our business in cybersecurity, although it definitely is there as far as bringing into the light, the number, the severity of incidents that these publicly traded companies are experiencing. But also this is valuable for investors and for other companies. This levels the playing field. 
first off, this makes sure that investors are fully aware of what's going on with the companies they're invested in. Honestly, investing in a publicly traded company, I think today, companies don't disclose enough, I think, to truly understand how they're operating, what their risks are, everything else. Um, a lot of companies have these these uh, financial reports today that are really cherry-picked as far as, hey, look over here, not over here. Uh, we're going to bring all these businesses together under this heading and report it in this way. Uh, we're not going to report unit sales, but we're just going to report aggregated dollar amounts and blah, blah, blah. There's all sorts of sleight of hand that's done there. Um, and, and again, the fact that I think something we're going to talk about in just a minute says that only 30 companies disclose this in their 8Ks. That's not fair that they did and these thousands of other companies that un doubtedly experienced cybersecurity incidents didn't report. So I love the leveling of the playing field here to inform investors, but also make sure all companies are playing by the same rules. Like I said, there were companies that filed those eight dash case. And so in between 2020 and 2021, like Adam said, only 30 publicly traded companies filed an eight dash K disclosing that they had a cybersecurity incident. Very, very important information because from those filings, we can, look at the data and glean a lot of information like how much they paid, how much it costs, all of these things. So just to highlight a couple of the um, findings from the 8-Ks, Sinclair Broadcast Company, they experienced a ransomware incident in October of 2021, which resulted in $63 million loss of advertising revenue because they had a network incident and they couldn't broadcast. So during that time, they lost $63 million of advertising revenue and then $11 million in remediation costs. So that's significant. That's not even counting if they had to pay a ransomware, which I don't think in, they actually disclosed if they did or not. I'm assuming that they didn't have to in this case because it is a public filing, but just alone in remediation costs and then the loss of revenue is massive. Blackbaud, which is a cloud technology company, experienced ransomware in May 2020. They recorded $10.4 million in expenses related to the incident. But then after the fact, they were hit with 570 claims for reimbursement of expenses from customers or their attorneys related to the incident. In February of 2022, so almost two years later now, they're still dealing with it. They finally entered into a credit agreement that anticipated up to $50 million of non-recurring legal expenses paid in cash associated with the data breach and ransomware attack. So a lot of expenses going into this that people don't think about because it's not just the ransomware payment, but it's also the remediation costs, the legal fees, lawsuits that might happen. I didn't, for me, I didn't even think about the litigation that might happen due to a ransomware incident. And as you can see from the filings, one company was hit with 50 million additional dollars on top of their incident response and remediation. Now they're having to pay in lawsuits after the fact. So again, overall, I think having a mandatory reporting gives a lot of information to the, the shareholders. It levels the playing field, like Adam said, because undoubtedly there's, more than just 30 companies that suffered ransomware attacks. And now they will all have to report that. We had also mentioned, and I'll just highlight again, because we are talking about reporting the FDIC, the federal deposit insurance corporation, which insures all of the financial banks and institutions um, in our country. They issued a new rule and it was announced November 2021, it takes effect April 1st, and it requires full compliance by May 1st, 2022, which is coming up, that require any banking organization or banking service provider to report any significant cyber security incidents within 36 hours of discovery. So that's already been passed. And there's even more news that the FCC, which uh, takes care of like our mobile carriers like T-Mobile and all that, like T-Mobile had a significant incident last year. 
the FCC is also looking at proposing rules. So all of these separate agencies that industry and companies are part of are starting to finance, start to issue out policies and rules for cybersecurity incidents. So I think this is just going to be pretty standard upcoming. And I, again, I think it's a great thing. Yeah. And, and you touched on earlier the, how this will force companies, I think, to take this even more seriously, where having the right leaders in oh. place, having security properly funded helps keep you out of the news, essentially helps keep you from making those public disclosures. So more than ever, where in the past, some of these could be swept under the rug and not disclosed. I think with this threat hanging overhead, that this is only going to snowball. And if you are regulated by almost any federal agency, you may be required to do so. If you're publicly traded, you may be required to do so. We're running out of companies here other than like privately traded that aren't involved in one of those critical infrastructure groups uh, where you would still not have a requirement to report. Um, Otherwise, you know, this is, this is coming the new normal, which means not only do you want to limit the scope, but you still want to prevent. Right. And, and so obvious investment will follow because this is now we're starting to affect the pocketbook. And that's, that's kind of what had to happen all along is until it became something more than just paying cyber premiums or a uh, cyber deductible. Now we're talking, you know, real material impact to business and reputation um, across the board. Cause I think, I, I've remarked on this show in the past that I think companies have started to fall into this this thought process that, you know, cyber attacks are becoming so common that we don't really have to worry about if we suffer one because A, we may not have to report it at all. And B, even if we do, they're so common, who's going to pay attention? And I think ratcheting the the kind of scrutiny back up that you're going to have to report to your regulator, you're going to have to report to your industry, you're going to have to report to Wall Street, those are all going to be material impacts. And I think we're going to see another round of investment in this too. On top of all of the squeeze people are already feeling from uh, the Russia-Ukraine situation, uh, from some of the other additional memorandums and rules issued by the federal government around non-fishable multi-factor authentication, around zero trust network architecture, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's the, the line has really been drawn in the sand across the board that it is time for private enterprise to really step up their game in cybersecurity. And for all of us in this industry, that means more money, more opportunity, and those are wins for everybody listening to this show. Some other news, CISA reported a misconfigured, I'm going to start that over. <laughs> Sorry. In some other news, CISA reported a Russian state-sponsored attack that was exploiting some misconfigured multi-factor authentication at a non-government organization or otherwise known as an NGO. What they did was they capitalized on a misconfigured duo multi-factored authentication account and they were able to enroll their own device with MFA and then infiltrate the victim's network. Once they were in, they used the another, the print nightmare vulnerability to then propagate through the network and escalate further. But what was interesting about this was when they gained initial access, they were able to do that through compromised credentials. So they used brute force to find a weak password and they were able to brute force that particular password and the victim's account had been unenrolled due to a duo setting that after a long period of inactivity the device would be unenrolled but the account was not disabled in active directory and so because of this they were able to get the password because it was simple re-enroll the user using their device and then complete the authentication requirements and then escalate from there. I found this interesting because 
oftentimes as security defenders, we come up with configurations and policies to make sure that things are secure. But there may be holes in our configurations. So one of the examples that I'd like to give is in Azure Active Directory, oftentimes Adam and I talk about conditional access and using that as a trigger to enroll devices or provide conditions to access data. There is a workbook, an Azure workbook that you can use called Conditional Access Gap Analyzer. And it's available. We'll put a link in the show notes for it. And you can load this into your into your conditional access policies and look at the workbook and see if there are situations in there where you maybe have configured conditional access for this application, but not for these applications, or maybe for these users for this application, but not for these users. And so it's really powerful to go through that to see if there are any gaps, because that is one of the ways attackers are getting in because you have conditional access configured for some, but not for others. Another thing that is good for conditional access is the insights reporting. And that's also built in on a tab for conditional access. You can look at insights and see how conditional access policies are affecting your particular um, organization, your users, your applications when they access them. Now, I know a lot of companies are using IDPs other than Azure Active Directory. I'm not aware of reports like this for, say, Okta. I was an Okta admin at my previous organization. And most of the time, the only condition that you could use is a network IP address. There wasn't anything per app that I found that you could report, but maybe there is. So again, this is more around, let's make sure after we deploy those configurations to go back and validate and make sure that we're actually protecting what we need to. I'll I'll do a short anecdote um, of a friend who recently was trying to help her security organization test their MDM enrollment. And they were moving from one MDM solution to another. And the security guys thought that you couldn't access company email on a non-enrolled device. But when she went to add email to her phone, it didn't prompt her to enroll in MDM. And so she was like, aha, I found a hole in our MDM solution. And I'm like, well, it's not really a vulnerability within your MDM solution. It's a misconfigured policy within your MDM. So this is just a call to validate your settings, especially for identity and device management to take a look because in this case, this was called out by CISA as a bulletin that state actors were able to exploit a misconfigured MFA. When I first saw this, I thought it was something else because there were reports of duo and again, not really being compromised, but when all of the Solorigate compromises were happening, one of the things the attackers were doing was to steal all of your private keys that are used to sign and improve various identity things. And so they were stealing some sort of private key related to Duo and essentially using that to create their own MFA tokens or something like that. I'm a little fuzzy on the details, Um, which is not what this is about. So, You know, listening to you walk through it, Andy, what I was kind of doing in my head as you talked about it was thinking through ways you could protect against this. And obviously your call out against proper configuration is one, but I was just kind of enumerating different ideas in my head as you went. So number one, you you mentioned brute force. Most likely what they're what they're using when we talk about brute force like this is password spray. They're not trying, you know, multiple attempts against one user. They're spraying the whole organization, which is definitely a type of brute force to see if somebody has a weak password. I often tell the story of how they password sprayed Microsoft's own organization many years ago and discovered multiple users were using Seahawks 12 exclamation mark, a reference to the 12th man, the Seahawks crowd that helps the Seahawks win home football games and how noisy they are. 
And uh, so that's most likely what happens. So how do you protect against password spray? Well, that's hard. Number one, you offload as much of your identity infrastructure as possible to your cloud provider, who has much more sophisticated detection for password spray. So you're not like running your own ADFS server, if at all possible, as an example. Number two, you implement password protection capabilities where you're blocking weak passwords from being set in the first place. There's a capability of that built into Azure AD. I don't know about other IDPs, but again, look into blocking weaker common passwords, not just password complexity requirements. Then we talked about them re-enrolling an MFA token for a long dormant account, an idled account. So of course, there's the hygiene of keeping your Active Directory clean and making sure dormant accounts are set to disabled within a timely fashion. However, a tool that also does some UEBA and is looking at normalized behavior for identities may have flagged an alert on this. If an account is set dormant for a very long time and suddenly signs in again, a tool like Microsoft Defender for Identity may have alerted on this as well. So protection for your on-premises identities and doing UEBA against those identities is another valid method of potentially stopping and preventing this attack. And then finally, this wasn't called out in the report you're talking about, but something we've mentioned in the past on this show is ensuring that your cloud administrators are not synchronized identities from on-premises because as these attackers were able to use this, this duo misconfiguration to gain lateral movement and potentially privilege escalation in the environment, the thing we definitely don't want them to do is be able to also pivot and compromise your cloud services. And if you are not synchronizing your admin accounts for say Microsoft 365, rather those are cloud only accounts, you've at least prevented them from making that jump and also compromising say your M365 environment. So those are just some thoughts as you kind of talk through that. And I like your call out too, of course, just validating your configuration Penetration testing might find that as well, as well as just double checking your work, making sure that it's it's hardened all the way. A good call out on something like conditional access, which by default allows access. The default behavior is to allow. And so the only way you lock it down is by creating policies that do deny or do allow, but only with this to happen, like multi-factor authentication. So great call outs there. But it's interesting how a sim- simple anecdote like that we can sit through and, and I'll admit it's armchair quarterbacking a little bit, but go through opportunities to where we can block that. And it goes back to that whole story around defense in depth, right? I named several different ways that we could have prevented that attack from progressing. And it's the sum total of those. If you implement all of those, when you reach a really, really strong security posture. I really like how you walk through a bunch of different ways our admins can try to protect against this attack. I'm going to name one more at Microsoft. We do this every time we enroll a device into MDM. I get an email to my user account email saying, Hey, someone enrolled a device into MDM and you need to validate. Was this you? If not, something happened, right? Mm -hmm. That actually is a good thing. Cause if that would have happened here, obviously it's a dormant act account and so maybe no one's actually monitoring the email but this could be a way to actively see if someone's exploiting user accounts and in fact this was how FireEye discovered someone was in their network during the solar winds attack FireEye, if you remember was actually compromised during that whole solar winds incident they discovered that there was an attacker in their network because the attacker made a mistake and enroll the device into their duo MFA and the user who had the compromised credential got an email saying a new device was enrolled into MFA. They notified their security, um, the uh, incident response reporting team. And that's how they did some forensics. And they're like, Oh yeah, we have someone in our network. Mm -hmm. So just having a simple alert to a user obviously they have to be monitoring their email and an active user, but alerting is always good. And hopefully the more that you have spread out, users will look at that and scrutinize and be like, Hmm, I didn't enroll a device into MDM. I didn't enroll a new multi-factor token or, or device. So this is strange. Love it. Maybe I should report this.
Our final story that we're going to talk about is just hearkening back to a few weeks ago when we were talking about geopolitical um, incidents and how that relates to cybersecurity. We had talked about how one of the companies that Adam and I had talked to was worried about the conflict that might happen. And ultimately, unfortunately it did, but how to protect their Ukraine citizens if Russia were to take over. And I had made a comment about certificates and how state actors or state governments can spy on their citizens. And in fact, Kazakhstan a few years ago had required their citizens to install a certificate onto their devices in order to get internet access. When you install a certificate that's not typically trusted, they can spy on your your network traffic. And so I didn't think that this was something that was in the works, but I was wrong. Um, The EFF actually released a statement and it's being reported in the news that Russia is issuing its own certificate authority or its own certificate. The internet governance entities, the ICANN and RIPE rejected Ukraine's request to revoke top level domains from its domain name service, root servers, and its IP addresses. But because of all the sanctions that have happened, a lot of the certificate authorities, like Digicert, are stopping their services and revoking their certificates for the .ru domains. So Russia has issued their own certificate, and they're basically instructing their citizens if they want to continue to have access to the internet and these sites to install and trust that certificate. Most of the major browsers are probably going to have a rule in place. Hopefully if it hasn't taken effect already, it will be in the works soon. So Firefox and Chrome and edge should have rules to automatically not trust or revoke these certificates. And you should not trust them obviously because they have the ability to issue certificates for the .ru domains, but they also have the ability to inspect traffic for users who are communicating with those domains. Now, there is a workaround for Russian citizens, which is the Yandex browser, which is a Russian browser. I think it's actually based on Chromium, if I'm not mistaken. But that one will, I think, automatically trust this Russia certificate. So for those citizens who are probably still trying to get access to the Internet, that's their workaround. But for the rest of the Western world and anyone else who's using browsers, if you get this certificate, you should not trust it. I think one of the hardest things to predict ahead of time is we were talking through what if scenarios with customers was I don't think anybody realistically could have said, I predicted that the entire Western world would essentially isolate Russia uh, from the rest of the world in terms of sanctions, in terms of shutting down business there, in terms of trade restrictions, everything else. It really is astounding. And I've said that, you know, a couple of weeks ago when we most recently spoke about this topic And it makes sense why the Russian government did this, issued this trusted root certificate. And I totally understand the need for it. If if nobody else is going to issue them, somebody has to. But of course, I think there's also um, other other possibilities for how that could be used. And it's it's you know our job as security professionals to point out that if you implicitly trust a root certificate from your government. Uh, any encrypted traffic with anything that that is you know built off of that certificate then would have the potential to be uh, intercepted and decrypted. So there is that risk, and, and obviously nobody else should install or, or trust this or use it. Uh, however, I understand the need for, for Russia and the Russian people to do it. Um, and it's one of those situations where, you know, I think the unfortunate side effect of this uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine <laughs> It has been 
of course, the negative impact for the Ukrainian people, but also the sanctions have made life very, very difficult for the Russian people, many of whom, you know, do not support and and were not in favor of this invasion in the first place. And this is an example where I, I think everyone's trying to make lemonade out of lemons here. Um, but but again, yeah, good call out that that's out there. And, and if you see it, obviously do not trust it um, if you're outside the Russian Federation. But uh, interesting that that really did come to pass. And I think, Andy, our discussions were more around if Russia would invade Ukraine and then impose that upon the Ukrainian people uh, to monitor and intercept their traffic, which could still come to pass, but hasn't yet. This is more one of those unpredictable things where again, didn't predict the depth of sanctions that would occur and the need for Russia to start really um, acting as an isolated country does and doing everything themselves. And and this is an example of that. I just didn't realize how far along Russia had plans, really. I think this was in the works. And as I was researching this episode, there was a test that Russia did last year where they basically isolated themselves from the world, from the internet aspect. And so they've done basically plans, uh, run through plans of whether or not they can isolate themselves completely from the world, um, from an internet aspect. There's a lot that happens, you know, again, with the internet governance, they haven't revoked the .ru domains quite yet. Uh, their IP addresses. So that there's not a way right now to completely isolate them from the rest of the world, but maybe they'd have to stand up their own internal, you know, root servers and everything. And that's not happened yet. So not completely isolated, but I just didn't realize how far along their plans are. And, and they are planning for that contingency if it were come to pass. So that is our show for this week. Thanks for listening. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you guys have any questions or topics you want us to talk about. Thanks, and we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.